Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shamanti Namani Namaste Sharashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Sasanivari Pashatya Dasatarine Can you set it up so you don't have to admit people? I have already done it, Maharaj. Okay. Nama Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Chami Iti Namane Namaste Sharashwati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvise Sasanyavari Paschacha Desatarine Jasi Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nathananda Shri Adhita Gadadha Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jasi Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nathananda Shri Adhita Gadadha Sivasri Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithananda Shri Adhita Gradhar Sivasri Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Itai go Premanandi, Hare Hare go. You probably hear the lawnmowers in the background. You hear them? No? Oh, good. Well, that's good. Anyway, they were in the same key that I was singing, so some divine arrangement between us and the lawnmower. Do we have the transcription service still? It's, or it's on another, it's not on this one. Because we could use the transcription service. <laughs> anyway. So um, today we're departing 
taking off in a different direction spontaneously without previous notice. And um, the reason is, is um, I was meditating on Prabhupada being like a thunderbolt and Prabhupada being like a rose. And it, and it has lots of significance for us as individuals and for us as an organization. And I wanted to talk about it. And so we named this class, he could build a house in which the whole world could live, but can we? In other words, can we do the same thing? And as I remember, an astrologer saw a picture of Srila Prabhupada. I don't, I don't think he looked at his chart. He just saw his picture. And by seeing his picture, he made that statement, this man could build a house in which the whole world can live. So it's not that he built a house. It's not that he's building a house. Well, you could say he's building. You could say he's built. But I think it's better to say he can. And it depends on us. So the question is, can we? One time, Prabhupada said, if someone leaves our movement, half of it is their fault and half of it is our fault. So of course, we have to ask what half is their fault, what half is our fault, because we, we have to take responsibility right, for our half. So if we're going to build a house in which the whole world can live, then we have to understand the 50% that's our fault and don't, don't commit those mistakes so that whoever comes can stay. So if someone gives up Krishna consciousness, and a lot of people, of course, leave ISKCON and don't give up Krishna consciousness, but sometimes when someone leaves ISKCON, they, they don't take part in Krishna consciousness in any other organization. And then they suffer without the association. And, and often they give up their Krishna consciousness, so they give up a lot of it. So in that sense, it's our fault uh, if that happens to somebody. So I think it's, it's, it's one of the greatest travesties in our movement if someone comes and they leave because of our behavior, because of our words, because of our interaction with them. And someone leaves due to their own choice, due to their own weakness, often there's nothing we can do. But if they leave because of our behavior, it's a problem. Of course, sometimes people will blame us uh, and we actually didn't misbehave. It's their perception. That's, that's something different. But if it actually is our fault, if we actually could have done something which would, been, would be appropriate to do to prevent them from leaving, then we should. Sometimes we may do something to, to try to save someone that's not appropriate. We actually shouldn't do it. We're going beyond, let's say, the, the principles or practices of Krishna consciousness in order to help someone. So I'm, not, I'm talking about within the jurisdiction of our, of our duty within Krishna consciousness of our... Um, yeah within, yeah, within our duties, what's proper for us. So this, uh, so, so one time Prabhupada was asked, how far will Krishna consciousness spread? No, he was asked, excuse me, how far is the prediction that Krishna consciousness will spread to every town and village? How far is that true? I'll take a sip. That'll give Anuradha time to catch up. I should, I should probably drink a lot. Uh, now, she can't drink. Only I can, because if she drinks, then... Well, you can drink while I'm talking, right? Yeah. If I speak and drink, it'll be easier for her. I have great sympathy for the translators. It's such... It really, it really taxes the brain. They probably all have to go to sleep after the class. Does it tax your brain, Anurata? Her brain is, she has unlimited energy. Well, I guess it, yeah, it depends. After about an hour, it starts taxing, right? 45 minutes an hour. Even. 
I've seen some translators, you know, we're translating live. And after like an hour, they're like, they keep asking me, what did you say? What did you say? Whereas normally in this situation, they don't ask. It's, you know, on the online situation, they just, they don't understand, they do their best. So Prabhupada was asked, how far is the prediction that Lord Chaitanya made? True. Is it actually, is that an absolute prediction? Every town and village. Prabhupada's don't worry, Krishna consciousness is going to spread to every town and village. You can just go to sleep. It's going to happen. Kind of like that was the, the mood of the question. Does it really matter? Like if we try hard and we strain our brain and we give everything to spread Krishna consciousness and we study the scriptures really well so we can articulate our philosophy in a way people can benefit, understand, resonate with, is all that important or is it just going to happen? Good question. And Prabhupada said, it will depend on you. How far that prediction is true will depend on you. That's an interesting answer, right? I think a lot of us, when we read it, we think, well, Lord Chaitanya said it, so sit back and, you know, watch it happen, whether you, so that, you know, just be an instrument, Krishna has done it all. That, that is not the way Prabhupada chose us to see it, although you could philosophize it that way. Lord Chaitanya has put it in motion. But that, of course, would minimize the greatness of Prabhupada, the greatness of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, greatness of all the Acharyas. Well, it's just destined to happen. You know, they just showed up and Lord Chaitanya was pulling the strings and they just did nothing except get pulled. Of course, that's a glory in itself if you can be pulled by Lord Chaitanya. So I don't want to minimize that. But it could minimize the contribution of the devotees. And it could minimize, well, well, somebody had to come to America, you know, so Prabhupada just did it. You know, it was all ordained. That you can say, yes, it's ordained. But who does Lord Chaitanya ordain to do it? The pure devotees and the ones who have the most compassion. So, you know, we have to say it's kind of a combination of both. It's, it's going to happen, but we have to make it happen, kind of like that. So that's, uh, and it's a better way for us to think, isn't it? Yeah. So how far, how far will, is this prediction true? Well, that will depend on you. So we should never think that, well, Prabhupada's a pure devotee and he wants Krishna consciousness spread. So whatever I do or don't do, it's not gonna really matter much. Don't think like that. And we have seen that if we deal with people with compassion as Prabhupada did, with tolerance as Prabhupada did, with forgiveness as Prabhupada did, with acceptance as Prabhupada did, with being um, strict with them when they need it, but being kind with them when they need it. You know, every, we, we see that if we deal with people, then in these ways, people will be happy to be part of, of the Krishna consciousness movement. They'll be happy to stay, they'll be inspired they want to do devotional service. And the opposite is also true. If people feel judged, criticized, uh, unaccepted, etc., made to feel that something's wrong with them, why would they want to be part of an organization that makes them feel that way, right? You expect that when you get out of the material world and join Krishna consciousness, you're not going to be made to feel that way. And lo and behold, sometimes you are made to feel that way. And lo and behold, sometimes maybe more so than before you were devoted, which is horrible. Now, again, some people may perceive that they're made to feel that way when they're not, just because they're hearing the philosophy preached, you know, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. That's another thing. 
those people are in the minority. It's not, they're not ordinary, you know, those people, uh, extremely sensitive people, people who have had difficult lives. It's sometimes hard for them to hear the philosophy because the philosophy is heavy. But I'm talking about in how we present the philosophy specifically in terms of personal relationships, interactions, and being able to understand how to present Krishna consciousness in a way that people feel, I can do this, I can relate to this. This is, this is not gonna make me feel guilty. So now you might say, but Prabhupada was very, very strict. And sometimes I hear something that he said and it makes me feel guilty. Okay, so I wanna deal with that. So I think there's, there's maybe three things we have to look at. And I'm, I'm gonna describe how Prabhupada dealt with devotees because we should deal with them in the same way or similar ways. We can't imitate, but we can learn. I think where the problem lies often, or maybe most commonly, where the preacher is not really at fault, is the philosophy is heavy. I mean, it is, right? I mean, if you do X, you're gonna suffer. If you do Y, you're gonna suffer. X is right, Y is right, Z is wrong. I mean, you, you have to say that, don't you? I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's like, you can be nice, you can present it nicely, but you know, at a certain point, you have to tell people, you know, you're gonna die, right? In case you're trying to avoid that. And there is karma for eating meat and so on. You, you know, you, you just, you know, you can beat around the bush a little bit, you know, you can put syrup on it, but you know, you still have to say it ultimately, right? So, so I think sometimes people, they don't separate the philosophy from how the individual devotee is dealing with them. Because, you know, Prabhupada would give class and, you know, be like the thunderstorm and shake us up. But then when you would deal with him, it was much different. He might, you know, he might say, you know, you should do this, you shouldn't do that, you know, in the class. But then he sees you're not exactly doing it and he doesn't say anything. Because he as a person is not black and white and he understands people are on different levels and they advance differently. So in his personal interaction, it's different. But when you give a class, you're just establishing a principle, right? So I think we're all in a sense liable to be judged that way, even if we're the nicest, softest, sweetest, most liberal devotee, when we explain the philosophy, you can only put so much sugar on it. You know, I mean, you know, if you take the frosting off the top and eat the cake, sometimes there's neem leaves in it. You know, what can you do? Um, you did your best, you put frosting on it, you know, but they kind of like put, knock the frosting off the cake and now they're eating the neem leaves. Uh, what can be done? So, so that's a fact. We can't, you know, we can do our best to present it nicely, put a little sugar in the candy, put a little cherry flavor and, you know, so that they get it down. But some people, it's going to be difficult. What can we do? We can only try to present it in a way that they can digest it. But some things are hard to digest for some people. I mean, you know, what can you do, you know? I mean, what about, you know, celibacy? That's not like the most popular topic out there right now. And so, you know, what do you say? Okay, you can say, do your best, you know, but still you have to explain the benefit of it. We, um, 1990, some, 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 maybe like 94, 95, we came up with a booklet. It's about 25 page booklet. It was about so big, a newsprint. And it was geared towards people about 16 to let's say 22. And it expressed the philosophy in their language in a very, very cool way and a very easy to understand. And we printed, I don't know, 25,000 or something. And 
they cost us like five cents to print, so we could just give them out. And we asked people to write back what they thought. And the way it was explained was so, it was so well explained and so easy to digest that we, in every letter was practically exactly the same. I read your booklet. I believe, I believe everything you said, or I accept everything you said, but I have what question about, what do you think that question was about? Sex. I believe everything, but I have one question about sex. That was the thing that was just like, you know, I don't get it, you know, like, um, so, you know, we can't compromise, but, and, and you all know that Prabhupada was very strict about getting up early, chanting 16 rounds and so forth, but, when Prabhupada was writing, uh, uh, okay, I'm saying but, so this is a qualified but. So I, I'll explain myself before, before someone blows a fuse. But at the time Prabhupada was writing those letters, probably 90% of the movement was living in the ashram or grihastas who are full-time devotees living next to the temple. And often um, there were, rooms in the temple for grihastas or houses next door. So it was like everyone was in the temple. So, so when you read these letters, everyone should get it before 16 rounds, four principles. And it seems like, well, if you don't do that, you, 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 know, you have no hope or something's wrong with you. And, you know, and you're thinking, why was Prabhupada so strict? Well, that was the standard for the temple. As you know, any of you who live in a temple, you know that was the standard. But now you might say, okay, that makes sense. You're living in a temple. This is the standard. You can't have people getting up at four, five, six, seven, three rounds, 10 rounds. No, this is a standard, right? If you want to live in the temple, this is standard. If you can't follow the standard, no problem. Just you can't live in the temple, but we're not going to kill you. We're not going to shame you. Or we're not going to say, well, you're definitely going to the hell. You know, there's a hell for people who don't chant 16 rounds. You read that in the fifth canton? No, there is no such hell. But um, you could be made to believe that. But, but that was not Prabhupada's mood. Now, you might say, wait a minute. I read that Prabhupada said, if you don't chant 16 rounds, you're an animal. Because an animal can't keep a promise. Now, what was Prabhupada directing that to? This is important, because that's a heavy statement, isn't it? But I believe that was also Prabhupada's, it was his, that was his level of integrity. You don't promise and not follow. What kind of, you're not a human being if you make a promise and don't follow it. Of course, for us non-humans, that was pretty normal. Well, I didn't really know what I was doing. I just thought it was fun to get initiated and you know, I thought I could do it, you know. For us subhumans, yeah, we make promises like whatever, you know. Yeah, I'll get married, stay with you for life until, you know, the next door neighbor moves in and she's way more beautiful than you and, you know, it's over. So that's where, that's the world we live in. Prabhupada lived in a different world. His world was, you make a promise and it's it, that's it, you know. It's, you know, the girl next door may be beautiful, but that has nothing to do with anything. It's just, you don't, don't worry about it. That's his world. Our world is different. So when Prabhupada said heavy things like that, we have to understand the context. Number one, it was a context of integrity. Like how could you promise and not do it? Okay, that makes us feel bad, but I think it's good for us because we need that, don't we? We can't just like make a promise and just take it lightly. But there's another point which is the thunderbolt rose. Prabhupada said, why did you take the vow if you're not gonna follow? So he was only, was this really super strictness, you know, like you take a vow, you, you promise you don't follow, you're not even human. All of that was for people who took vows. It wasn't for those who didn't take vows. He wasn't heavy on people. Why you're not chanting 16 rounds? Well, I've only been in the temple well, look, this is my first Sunday feast. You know, it wasn't, you know, he wasn't like that. Yeah, you know, we might be like that. You know, like what's wrong with you? This is your second Sunday feast. 
and you're not chanting 16 rounds. Well, I don't want to see, I'm not going to talk to you to the chanting 16. You know, we used to be like that in the early days, you know, a little fanatical, you might say, like, not just a little, like, like Nadia, Iska 1970, we left the Russians in the dust in fanaticism. They, you don't even know what fanaticism is. That was like, we were like, we did not, if someone came to the Sunday feast like three times and didn't become a devotee, I'm, this is not a joke. We didn't even talk to them. Like, what is wrong with them? They have not moved in the temple. Why should I waste my time talking to them? We would talk to new people, seriously. 100% serious, it's not a joke. So, um, so Prabhupada said, why did you take a promise if you're not going to follow? And so what's the connotation? It's fine if you don't follow. I'm not going to, it's not going to bother Prabhupada. He's not going to chastise you. He's not going to call you an animal, subhuman, anything. It's like, fine, chant four rounds, follow three principles, whatever. But, but if you're going to move in the temple, you have to do 16 and four. If you're going to take initiation, you have to do 16 and four. If you've promised to do it, then you have to do it. If you're in a situation where you've made a promise, then you do it. So he's saying, well, don't pro if you can't do it, don't promise. But he's not saying if you can't do it, you're this, that, or the next thing. He never said that. So that's the rose part. The thunderbolt part is for those who made the vow. The rose part is for those who are coming to that position. They'll get the thunderbolt later if they don't keep the vow. But but if you keep the vow, you still get the rose. If you don't keep the vow, you get the thunderbolt, which is good for you. Because I, I know, I think we all have, have you ever got the thunderbolt and you realize that was actually the exactly what I needed because I was in so much illusion? Has that ever happened to you? Again, of course, I don't know. I don't give so many thunderbolts. So you might say, I don't know. You never give thunderbolts. I, I give them, but they're, they're not that often. Last year around April or May, I remember the classes I was given, there were lots of thunderbolts. I didn't realize they were, but when I, after the class, and I like, oh, that was pretty heavy. Um, but we all, we all know sometimes we're just cloudy. You ever, you know that period, you're kind of not thinking straight, you're cloudy and your spiritual life isn't that good, and then someone tells you something or you hear something in a class, which is like a thunderbolt class, and you walk out of class and go, that is exactly what I needed to hear. You know, three devotees may have committed suicide after that class because they couldn't take it, but you, you, know, you realize I, need, I needed that and you took it. So, you know, Prabhupada didn't, shoot thunderbolts just because it's fun or because he didn't like us or he wants to get back on us. And I don't want to say that any devotee does that, but I don't want to discount the possibility that that sometimes could happen. It just, you know, so-and-so is heavy and he likes being heavy. He thinks being heavy is what everyone needs. And it's true. We need heaviness, but we also need love, right? We need the good cop and the bad cop. I mean, the bad cop and the good cop. So, so I was thinking about this this morning and I was reflecting on, on my experience with Prabhupada, not intellectually analyzing my experience, but just kind of what I felt with Prabhupada. And I felt that most of the time, not though, because I observed this, but that's why I felt this. Most of the time, there were not thunderbolts. Most of the time, it was just syrup. It was encouragement. It was acceptance. It was not. It was not being judged. Um, and then every once in a while, why are you not printing my books? You know, seventeen books, two months. That was like a hundred and eight thunderbolts in like a hundred and eight seconds. You know, that was like whoa. Um, and sometimes Prabhupada shot thunderbolts. Which he wasn't even, they weren't in his mind like intentional thunderbolts. It was just the philosophy coming from the lips of a pure devotee, the realized person. And it was like, wow, I never realized that before. So Prabhupada was this, my point is 
he was this balance of rose and thunderbolt. And that's that's a description of the Vaishnava. Mahaprabhu was like that. All Vaishnavas, are, they're very soft. I don't know if you're aware of this, but you know, you see a picture of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, and sometimes you look at it, and it's like serious. He's very serious. And Prabhupada said he never danced in Kirtan. He's like super, super serious. And um, whenever Whenever I feel like I need a little sobriety, like an extra dose of it, I'd love to look at his picture because it just, it sobers me. It's like, he, he's serious. This process is serious. And, and you feel that coming from him. But if you read his biography, there's this whole other rose side that, that I think a lot of us aren't even aware of. It's really like soft, humble, compassionate side. I, I read a story where he went in the ashram once and he went around and put like blankets on all the brahmacharis that didn't have blankets, you know, things like that, like a kind of like this mother mood, you know, you wouldn't think, you know, see his picture, you wouldn't think that's kind of his mood. And um, a lot of devotees have stories about Prabhupada, kind of what I would call the mother, you know, looking out for them. Are you okay? Um, where are you staying? Oh, that's not good. Let me make a new arrangement for you. What happened to you? Why do you have a Band-Aid on your finger? What happened? You know, like these kinds of things. So Prabhupada in, embodied such a healthy combination of both. And that's why he could build a house where the whole world can live. Because if you embody the, the rose, then people who need the thunderbolt they'll think this is too like wishy-washy you guys don't even have philosophy it's just like everything is good we love everyone you know like that you know um nothing's wrong nothing's bad everything's good you know? and then if it's too strict it's like wow well, who wants to be part of this these people are like you know you know if we need an army these people would be good for it they're just like yeah good we do whatever you say yeah, good. You know. you know, you need that, no doubt, but that's only part of the equation. You need that. You need that. You definitely need that. Good, focus. This is what Guru Maharaj wants. Let's do it. But you need to be a human being while you do it, not a robot. Yeah, good. Okay, now I'm you're all thinking I'm making jokes on, with the Germans. I'm actually complimenting them because they can do that. I wish I could do that more, even though I have German ancestry. I need more of that you know, focus. Focus is good. No question. You know, sometimes we have to be a little ro robotic, robotic because we're like we can get too wishy-washy and just oh, I don't feel like it now. Doesn't doesn't feel like the right time to distribute books. I'm not really in the mood for it. Feels more like. Uh, I just need to chill. No. So, you know, we understand that we're humans, we have that side, but if you have too much of it, what kind of movement are you going to have, right? So you, so you need both, no doubt, right? But if it's too much, yeah, you know, only this, 14 hours a day on the street, book distribution, we eat one meal at 8 a.m. and we need to eat the next meal at 9 p.m. and when we come back. That is there for the, you know, for the Green Beret book distributors, but you know, and a lot of devotees, especially younger devotees, they love that. Yeah, front lines, we're gonna fight just as in the military, you have Green Beret or whatever you call it in your, the special forces in your country. But there's also the Pujaris, there's also the artists, there's also the devotees on, on doing book distribution, I mean, uh, doing Haryanam Sankirtan, there's also the man, you know, there's, there's everything, there's a place. So. Uh, Prabhupada never made somebody feel like, well, actually, you're useless because you don't do book distribution. You know, like, we really don't need you around. It's just like, it's our mercy that we give you your chapatis and doll. But you're kind of useless because you don't distribute books. He never made anybody feel that way, ever. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things that Prabhupada did, and, and, and please note this, because we should do it also, he would write to different devotees who were doing different services. And you know what he would tell them? He said, your service is the most important. And so, you know, you read a letter and say, 
the Gurukul is our most important project. And you're like, okay. And you register in your mind. Oh, well, that's good to know. Maybe I should, you know, maybe that's what Prabhupada wants me to do. I mean, I like to teach, I like kids, or I like to administrate. I have a degree in educational administration. Maybe I should, you know, start a school. And then the next letter you read to the Bhaktivedanta Institute, this scientific preaching is our most important program. Then you read the next letter to the college preachers. This college preaching is our most important program. And then of course, you read the letter to the book distributors. This book distribution is our most important program. If we distribute books, our movement will be successful everywhere. But he said that also about the Gurukul. If we're successful with the Gurukul, then our movement will be successful because they will be the leaders of the future. And so what was Prabhupada doing? Well, as I sometimes joke, the spiritual world is big enough to have many things perfect at the same time. Material world isn't. If one thing's perfect, the other thing is less than perfect. It's hard to have two perfect things. Um, and no, it's hard to have two most, not perfect, excuse me, most important. If this is the most important, how can that be the most important at the same time? It has to, it has to be first most important, second most. So what was Prabhupada doing? Obviously, he wanted the devotees to think that their service was most important. Why? Because then you're going to be inspired, right? I mean, if I say anhurata, the translation work you're doing for me is the most important service in this guy. Then anhurata is going to be, oh, I didn't know that. Wow, I feel really good doing this service. I thought I was, you know, I thought, well, anybody can do this, you know. So what was Prabhupada doing? He was building a house in which the whole world could feel encouraged that you're important, right? Isn't it? You are important. Alina, art, painting for Krishna, it's the most important service. And in fact, in the early days of the movement, Prabhupada saw the artist's service as the most important. There's no question. Because he knew that's how the books are going to sell. They said, Prabhupada said our books sell because of the paintings. And anyone who could paint, well, didn't matter what else they were doing, stopped everything they were painting full time. So, you know, is painting the most important service? At least at that time. And there are going to be more books and we need more pictures, windows to the spiritual world. So um, everybody felt like they had their place at, in Krishna's, at Krishna's lotus feet. So, it, it, but Prabhupada, at the same time, obviously Prabhupada was trying to encourage everyone, but at the same time, I believe personally that Prabhupada actually saw all services as most important, that everything for Krishna was most important. Because in our movement, everything that we do has its connection to bringing people to Krishna consciousness, right? There's like, there's really no service in and of itself that is distinct and separate from helping conditioned souls become Krishna conscious. So that way, everything was important. Okay, now, who is really the most important devotee in ISKCON? Who are the most important devotees in ISKCON? Really, when you get down to it, it's the cooks. They're the most important. Because if every day you have to eat burnt rice and burnt chapatis, this movement's gonna, it's going nowhere fast, isn't it? It's because of that good prasadam that we can do anything. And if there's no prasadam, then forget it. So really the cooks are the most important, isn't it? I mean, if you wanna be practical, yeah. And the book distribution is the most important. No, 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 the cooks are, because the book distributors don't eat nice prasadam, they can't do the service. But you could, you know, you can go down the list and you could say that. No, but the Pujari is the most important because we don't see the deities, we're not inspired. No, the Kirtani is the most important because we don't have nice Kirtan, we won't be inspired. No, the class givers, they're the most important because they don't give class, we won't be inspired, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's how Prabhupada saw. I think he just saw everybody is important. And so when he's saying this is most important, it was both. It was both a statement of the importance of that particular service, but also 
a statement of his own appreciation. So why is this important to discuss? Like, why am I, this is a total detour from the normal classes we're giving. And, you know, we've talked about topics like this before. Why did I want to talk about it today? Well, what is facing our movement now, and especially, uh, you will have to deal with this probably more than I will in the future, is schism, potential splits. And the splits are not splitting down the line of Siddhanta, although that's what it might seem like, because the arguments are seemingly philosophical. But really, when you analyze them, they're more down the lines of, more splitting down the lines of conservative and liberal, or more conservative or more liberal. And my point in discussing this is that we see within Prabhupada how he combined both into one personality. And that's the meaning of being soft as a rose and strict as a thunderbolt. I, I think we could say, we could reframe, rephrase that being liberal, as liberal as needed and as strict as needed according to time, place, and circumstance. And that was what Prabhupada was. You remember I was saying this very important point where if someone wasn't, we know how important it is to chant 16 rounds, but if someone wasn't, who was just coming to Krishna consciousness, was no problem in Prabhupada's mind and his heart. Uh, his, his whole mood was, well, you can't force anybody to do anything. And the way we quote unquote force, which we can't force, is to teach them why doing these things are important. But when we say we can't force, it's because they have to make the choice. So that was Prabhupada's mood. He wasn't in the mood of condemnation. He didn't, you know, could you imagine condemning people who are coming to the temple who are not following all the principles and practices? That would be crazy. And so Prabhupada didn't have that feeling in his heart. I think some of us sometimes do when people are coming for a long time. Like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you following? And um, he didn't have that. He had, he had, his mood was, this is your free will choice. This is, you are going to volunteer your energy and time. Based on understanding the philosophy, you will you will do it as you understand it more. He had that confidence. And so his basic paradigm was to give the philosophy and then let people make their choices as to how much they want to engage in devotional service. If they want to be a congregational member chanting four rounds. No one ever felt any kind of discrimination or any kind of uh, inferiority because that's where they were at. Prabhupada never made them. I mean, we may have made them feel that way. Not may, we did. But, Prab but Prabhupada didn't. You know, we were, we were not perfect representatives in every situation. So, so if our movement is to go on in a unified way, it's important for us to embody this healthy combination of being accepting, being accommodating. Um, I don't wanna use the word compromising because it can be misunderstood, but I don't have a better word right now. So let's say adjusting, adjusting, okay, adjusting is a better word, adjusting according to the individual. At the same time, maintaining the strictness and the traditions you know, and balancing them both. And to me, that's the sign of a healthy, integration of opposites. And if we can't integrate opposites in a healthy way, then we become imbalanced, right? Like there's something wrong with us. You know, we're, we're looking at the world from the right. We only see things from the right, or we only see it from the left. Could you imagine um, if we made a movie on this and all the conservatives 
were walking around like this and all the liberals were walking around like this. But then I think it would be obvious we'd want to go up to people and say, could you just stand straight and kind of combine both liberal and conservative into a more holistic synergistic view that would take in the best of both and synergistically create more balance. So that was my um, both observation of Prabhupada, but it was also my emotional experience of Prabhupada. And there was always this balancing because Prabhupada could be very, very heavy on the right side, very, very, very heavy. And some of the, and sometimes devotees may say, well, how, you know, sometimes Prabhupada was very heavy. How could you take that? He said, because we always saw the other side. And so we knew it wasn't like this, even though it looked like that. We never felt it that way. We always, even if Prabhupada was very heavy on one side or the other, we kind of felt it more like this because it was always going like this. It was always balancing. Does that make sense? Like, you know, it's like your father is very, very kind, very, very loving, and then he gets upset with you and you understand. I must have done something really bad because he never gets upset. Whereas if he gets upset with you every day, it's just in one ear out the other. You just don't pay attention to it. It's the only way to deal with it. It's just like, you just know he's just complaining because that's what he does. If he doesn't complain, it's not a good day for him. But if he never complains, and then he gets very, very upset about something, then you understand, oh, this must be serious. And you don't feel so bad because your experience with him is this very loving side. So it's, it's balanced. So that's what Prabhupada was. And so we, as individuals, we have different sides. We have a conservative in some ways, liberal in some ways. We have a male. We have a female side. If you're a man or woman, you have both. We have different, there's different aspects to us. And if, if one aspect becomes out of balance, then it can create this problem, uh, which started this class, was that people will feel they won't feel grounded within our movement. They'll feel something is wrong. Have you ever felt that way? You ever been with someone and you felt like the, this person's not balanced? Have you ever heard a class and you thought, this class is not balanced? Well, it's generally because the person is not balanced, the class is not balanced. I never felt that with Prabhupada. I've felt that with other people. Obviously, uh, this usually this happened more when they were younger, when they were out, they didn't they weren't balanced. They were just you know young brahmacharis who were very fanatical, and and so the classes were not balanced. But a lot of devotees um, had problems with those classes. The brahmacharis didn't because they were all out of balance, so no problem for them. You know that's what they wanted to hear, right? Everything's bad except brahmachari life and book distribution. That was, you know. If they heard like something else was good, I was like, no, 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 that was a bad class. Erase that. Throw away the, the recording of that class. We don't want it. But um, I never got that impression with Prabhupada. I never, I never heard a class and thought that was really out of balance. Of course, you're going to say, well, he's your guru. You wouldn't think that way. But aside from that point, so many times when, when Prabhupada would give the very strict, you know, philosophy, this is the philosophy, you know, this person's a demon for these 10 reasons. Oh, that's heavy. You're demonizing people. You know, there, there's a video out there someone sent me and um, the student answered on his question, two plus two is 22. And the teacher said, no, two plus two is four. And the parents came and said, you have to let our, our kid just, you know, be free to think you're limiting him. And then the principal fired her for not limiting her. For, for, for the principal fired her because she wasn't letting the student express his freedom. And she's saying, but two plus two is four, it's not 22. And, you know, this was on the news and everybody's talking about it. You know, what's going on in the world today? We're restricting our children. You know, we can't let them freely think I like that. And so the video ends where she gets fired and she gets her salary of 2000 plus 
severance pay of 2000, so it's 4000. And she says, it's not 4000, it's 22,000. That's how the video ends. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was that kind of, you know, just like anything goes type liberalism, you know, you can't judge. So um, obviously that's not who Prabhupada was, but my, my memory of Prabhupada's classes is sometimes it would be very much on this like very strict side. And I'd be like, okay, is there, th is there something else? And then Prabhupada would say, of course, if you can't do this, then you know, it would always like come back. Whereas ourselves sometimes we never come back or we, we go to the two, two plus two is 2200 and we don't kind of go to the other side. Well, actually it's four, but sometimes you have to be open. It could be 20, you know, we don't do that. We just kind of tend to do one side or the other. So always notice that Prabhupada would say, but of course, you know, it was always like, here's this elderly person who's lived life. He obviously wasn't out of balance like a, you know, six month brahmachari, you know. But the six month brahmachari kind of didn't hear when Prabhupada said, but of course the other side, they kind of like, at that point they stopped, the, you know, clogged up with wax or something, you know, their brain turned off. They didn't hear that because it didn't make sense to them. They didn't have a place in their brain for the other side because they were too young to know the other side. But that's what I always noticed about Prabhupada that he, he could embody like opposites. And sometimes Prabhupada could say something and then a year later, later say the opposite. And from him, for him, it was like, what's the problem? This is, this is like, right now, this is what it is. And one time, that's what he said, but Prabhupada, you said last year, you said this, which is the opposite. And Prabhupada would say, well, you believe me last year, believe me now. I'm saying the opposite now. You know? So it, like, it wasn't a problem for him to kind of shift from side to side because he had, he wasn't one-sided. And so when you get that one-sidedness, you know, all the people walking around like that or like this, you know, that would make a good little film, wouldn't it? That would be like, everyone would get it, you know? Like, and all the people in the middle were walking straight, they're like, what's wrong with those people? You know, like, why are, you know? And then you go up and talk to them. And you talk to the person like this, you know, to the left, and, and they're like, like, what's wrong with you? And they're like, two plus two is 2,200. You know, it's like the other people, two plus two is four. And if you don't write that down on your test, we will hang you, you know? So you, so you kind of, no, but you have to be open kind. You know, why can't it be 2200? No, it's four. If you don't listen to me, you're failing this class and we're going to chop your head off. So it would be so obvious of what's going on, right? Now, probably one of the, the, the bigger problems this causes is when you're reading Bhagavatam like this, or you're reading Bhagavatam like that, you know, you read the same purport and you give a class and it's like that. And I read the same purport and give a class and it's like that. And so like, what is it? It's, um, I think we all, um, all of us who are older than seven or eight years old, understand that the truth tends to lie more like this in the middle, not like that and not like that. There's always, it's always a balance, isn't it? Have you realized that? Have you seen that in your life? So, if there's going to be schisms in ISKCON, it creates people to create schisms, right? Because schisms don't exist outside of people's opinions and views. So if Prabhupada could build a house in which the whole world can live, that means the people whose heads go to the right and the people whose heads go to the left feel comfortable in that house. They feel that they have a place. They feel that they're heard. And there's some amalgamation of both views. And we need to be more like that. And if we're not, then there's going to be schisms over right-headed people and left-headed people. Not really over Siddhanta. There won't be a schism over Siddhanta, although that's what it'll look like. But it'll be a schism over how people see the Siddhanta from what side. 
and how attached they are to keeping their head this way. Prabhu, could you just like move your head up like this just to save the movement? No, I won't because this is how it is. Okay, then what's going to happen? We're going to have a right sided movement and a left sided movement and maybe a third movement in the middle. I don't know. Maybe 2300 movements. Um, I live in Alachua and I count, I, I went on this program during COVID to figure out how many churches there are in Alachua. And I didn't look in the, the phone book to find out, or I didn't Google it. I just would drive around and I'd count them. There are 7,000 people in Alachua and there are 20 churches. Do the math, everyone. There's a church for, for every like 280 people, something like that, isn't it? Or did I do the math wrong? Okay, you have 20 churches. Yeah, no, it's more than, it's like for every, what, 300 and some odd people, 318 people or something, each has their own church. Why do you need, do you actually need that? Oh, well, the churches are small, they only fit 300 people. Okay, maybe, yeah, but you know, the first Baptist church of the savior of the cross, the second Baptist church of the Immaculate Conception, the first Baptist church of the holy names, you know. And then I'm thinking, okay, so we're gonna have the first Hare Krishna temple of Orthodox Prabhupadaism, the second Hare Krishna temple of Ritvikism, the third Hare Krishna temple of, of um, reform, reform Krishna, you know, it's like, is that what's going to happen? You know, so, you know, you go back to Alachua in 20 years and there's 20 Hare Krishna temples. I think that actually there are three there right now. There are, there's one for Ritviks, one for Narayam, Bodhi Math, Narayam Raj, and then Iskand. Of course, you have temples in everyone's homes, but those aren't public. So, um, yeah. So if Prabhupada could build, so the question is, if Prabhupada could build a house in which the whole world can live, then how can we do that? I mean, we have to do that. If, that's, if we want to take that statement, which I think is a good idea, take that statement as an object of service, that will be our service to build a house in which the whole world can live, then how do we do that? How, and, and my point of this class is, it's not just externally how you do that, but first it has to start internally. How can we create a house? What's, what's our, how do we understand Krishna consciousness and how it relates to people in a way that people can feel comfortable and inspired in spite of so many lackings that they have? Because um, Kali Yuga is a very interesting time, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's like sometimes, sometimes I go out and see what people are doing and I think, are we crazy to try to spread Krishna consciousness? This is like impossible. These people, even if they take to it, you know, they'll, they'll unravel after a while back into their old ways. You know, it seems like this is impossible, right? Especially from my perspective as a spiritual master, you know, sometimes you have disciples that are like, Jai Prabhu! And then three months later, there's no jais, there's no prabhus, there's just silence, you know. And then you get the letter, I uh, wasn't doing so well uh, for the last few months. I'm really sorry. Like, like, you know, making people Krishna conscious is not easy. Kali Yuga is just like bombarding them with tamaguna and just pushing them down, isn't it? Have you noticed? Yes, Prabhu, I've noticed, not on other people, but on myself. Yeah, yeah, forget everyone else. I have enough trouble myself, right? The fact is that the process of sadhana is our protection. So when that's weak, then, you know, it's like, you, you know, we're holding up the world on our head. Don't you do sadhana? It's like a little board's holding it for you. <laughs> Your sadhana gets weakened. It just crashes down on you. What can you do? So, um, so in, in order to have, it's not just having a vision to spread Krishna consciousness, it's having a heart which, which can 
manifest a vision where we can be both accepting and kind and put all kinds of syrup and maple syrup all over our philosophy at the same time not compromising at the same time we, we still give it because the worst thing you can do is to not give somebody what they need or the worst thing you can do is to not put some syrup on it because they're not going to take it without syrup so you can you can err on both sides isn't it so you know sometimes liberal people are criticized well they're they're watering it down and then and then conservative people are criticized well you're driving everybody you know you're you're so conservative your audience is like 0.0000000000001% of the universe you know it's like and the only people you're going to attract are more fanatics are going to preach the same thing to the other 0.1 point zero 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 one percent of the universe it's like we're going to we're going to go nowhere you know um and there is some truth on both sides no doubt right but it's not entirely true and and so you need both so we have to have enough balance within us to see the value of both sides and know how to combine that in a way uh, that's best for people so i was thinking today i was thinking of an example because as you know all i do is think right and when i have some free time to chill out it gives me more time to think so that's just what i do you know it's kind of like I guess that's what Brahmins do, you know. What, what, excuse me, sir. What is your occupation? Oh, I think. You get paid to think? Yeah, I do. I get paid to think. That's what I do. Every professor gets paid to think, you know, it's a great job, you know, just think and then teach what you think. Read something, think, teach it, and you get money for it. Wow. What could be better than that? So today I was thinking there's a joke there when I was a kid there, this. Three Stooges. I think I told you this before. There's like real stupid guys. Their IQ was like minus 108. And so uh, one of them, his IQ was minus 107. So he was the smart one. And he would chastise the other ones because all they would do are like stupid things. And he'd like take the you know, three of them and he'd take two of them and knock their heads together when they do something stupid, poke their eyes out, you know, all kinds of. I think today um, it would not be a politically correct for kids to watch that. But I watched it. Yeah, that's why. I'm so crazy, right? You're crazy because you watch the Three Stooges, you know. Um, the, the fact is, you know, good kids can watch stupid things and they won't become stupid. And bad kids can watch good things and they won't become good. You know, so it's like, it takes two to tangle there. So, so anyway, one time one of the Stooges said, you know, you know, I've been thinking. And the other one said, yeah, like, what are you thinking about? And the Stooges said, yeah. And for me, that's kind of dangerous. I've been, you know, so thinking can be dangerous. But fortunately, fortunately for us, we have a lot to think about that's not dangerous. In fact, it's really good for us, isn't it? So today, I was thinking, and for me, sometimes that's dangerous. No, but I wasn't dangerous. I've learned, I've learned how to think by becoming a devotee by the grace of Prabhupada. I have so many, I've got 80 volumes of books to help me think, you know, so we got all kinds of good things to think about. So I was thinking, okay, let's say I'm a athletic coach, right? So I want to be very encouraging, isn't it? I want to be very encouraging. So let's say, well, today I was at the beach, okay? The beach is exactly 13 minutes from where I'm staying now. So either in the morning or the evening, we go to the beach, because if I go in the water and swim, I get, I feel like, every chakra gets realigned because you know, I, I grew up by the beach and it's just like, I don't know, but it's, uh, why not go to the beach if you're 13 minutes away, right? It's healthy, you know, and swimming is a Vaishnava sport. Did you know that? There are two Vaishnava sports, swimming and wrestling. Did you know that? I don't know, girls don't like to wrestle so much, but swimming, these are Vaishnava sports. At least we were told. So I was thinking, so, okay, let's, let's say, let's say, Anuradha is with me, and Anuradha says, you know, I'd like to learn, of course, this would never happen, I don't think, and we would never do this, but Anuradha says, I would like to learn how to surf, and I say, okay, I will teach you how to surf, okay, 
What's that? This is before we're devotees, so it's all clean now, right? After we're devotees, it's not going to happen. But we're not devotees yet, and you know, it's all clean. Of course, if we're not devotees, she's only like three years old or something. Anyway, but so she says, I'd like to serve. So I'm very, I'm like, yeah, well, you used to be a dancer, or you still are a dancer. So surfing's kind of like dancing, you know, it's all about style and balance. You could be really good at this, right? So I'm encouraging her. So I'm showing her what to do. She goes out in the water and she's like a total mess. She keeps falling off and she's like, she doesn't know how to catch the wave when she does. She doesn't know how to get up. And she gets up, she falls off. So she comes back and I say, Anuradha, you're a dancer. This is like easy for you. It's all about balance. I think you're like psyching out because it's not the ground. You're not on the ground. You're on a board that's on water. Just pretend. You're on, you know, it's just ground, it's just dancing. So she's like, she reframes it into something she's good at. And all of a sudden she gets up, right? And she's doing much better. But, and so she says, thank you, that really helped me. That was so encouraging. And then I see something that she's doing wrong. I think, but your stand, the problem is when you surf, you can't stand like a dancer. You have to be bent over more. So it's not just about looking good, but it's about, if you're going to maneuver the board, you have to stand a certain way. So then I start getting a little heavy and say, well, the way you're doing it is wrong. You got to stand like this, put your foot, you know, so I start getting strict. And the reason is because I know if I don't tell her that she'll never get good. So now all the syrup, the syrup has done its job and now it's time for a few neem leaves, right? And that's what a good coach does, isn't it? Like they don't, they, they, if they know you can be better by eating a neem leaf, they'll give you the neem leaf, right? They've given you enough sweets that you're like, okay, he's good, he gives sweets. You understand the idea? So it, it's not that, you know, in the name of keeping every, helping everyone be Krishna conscious, we just give them syrup. But at the same time, they need syrup and they need a lot of it. That's part of it. But they also need neem, neem leaves for cleansing the blood and getting rid of parasites or whatever neem leaves do, right? So that's where the heavy side comes in. You're a nonsense, stop doing that. And, he's like, yeah. and then you cry and then the next day you go, actually, that's just what I needed to hear, thank you. So, but it's, but why, do, why did I give her the neem leaves? Because I want her to be better, that's the only reason. So, and when, we approach people with that mood, they will feel that. And that's why Prabhupada could be heavy because everyone knew that he would never act out of influence of the modes of nature. It was only coming from our highest interest. That's all that he was thinking of. So we could take it. Well, not everybody could take it so easily, but generally we would take it because we knew where it was coming from. So, how are we going to build a house in which the whole world can live? We're going to have to emulate Prabhupada as much as possible. Okay, so I'm going to stop and you maybe have comments or questions. I think that was clear. Was that clear? Well, well, the next part is you have to do it, but at least you're clear on what has to be done. But let me just underscore one thing. I think all of us, to some degree, are out of balance a little bit. And as we mature, psychologically, spiritually, materially, we hopefully are getting more in balance. And so we wanna see our out of balances. I hate this, this is so bad, everything's bad, this is bad, that's bad, he's bad, she's bad, this is bad, I'm bad, you know, it's like, okay, okay, is everything really that bad? Well, uh, well, he's not so bad and she's not so bad. And yeah, that was a nice festival. And like, oh yeah, right, right. So everything's not so bad. So. You see yourself, right? You know, or like, oh, everything's so great. You know, what do you mean so great? Our mom was almost, almost like split in half yesterday. Oh, no, no, we all love one another. It's okay. You know, it's like, come on, come down to earth. You know, it's not all a big fairy tale. So maybe, maybe you're like the ultimate optimist. You've never seen anything bad in your life. Well, that's nice, makes you happy, but that's not realistic, right? So, so you want to look. You want to look at yourself and see, am I, am I like, 
everything's bad, he's bad, she's bad, it's all bad. I have a God brother, every class is like that. That's, that's all he says in every class is how bad everything is. I've never heard him give a class other than how bad everything is. I mean, I'm serious, it's just, it's just an observation. Um, I think you know that if you've listened to classes from different people, with some of them, you kind of know before the class what they're going to say, isn't it? Kinda, okay, fasten your seatbelts, Prabhus, because this class is going to tell you how bad everybody is and how bad everything in this world is, because that's the only class he knows how to give. Why? Because that's his world. It's a little out of balance, because obviously everything is pretty bad. It's Kali Yuga, but you know, there's the Hare Krishna movement, and that's pretty cool. And there's Prasadam, and that's good. And the Holy Name is good. And Bhagavatam is amazing. And so many amazing devotees. And, you know, I have a nice house to live in. I have a nice wife. I have nice children. Like, it's not all that. You know. Yeah, she's just a bag of stool. <laughs> you know, so like, okay, you know, if you dissect her, she's a bag of stool. No doubt, of, well, more than just stool. Mucus, bile, air, and bones, blood, pus. Yeah. All right. But probably, you know, not the healthiest way to relate to her. Hey, bag of blood, bones, stool, urine, can you make some breakfast? You know, uh, I don't think that's healthy, but that's a Bakta Burfi moment, isn't it? <laughs> Hare Krishna, Bakta Burfi, he's got a rough life. Yeah. So you want to look at yourself and think, okay, if I'm all like, Levy Devi, everything's just fantastic. There are no problems. What's all this problems in people's minds? They just have to come to the nirvana stage and see the white light. Or you're on the other side. Probably something is like out of balance. What do you think? Maybe, possibly. Oh, it could be. Yeah, let me think about it. Yeah. So um, it's not that everything, it's not that there's not a lot of bad things out there. Definitely there are. I'm not saying there aren't. When Krishna says it, he's certified this material world is a place of misery. Yeah. That, so that's a philosophy, but there's psychology, right? So the philosophy is the place of misery, but if you wake up in the morning, you go, no need to get out of bed, it's just a place of misery. You know, it's like, okay, Gabriella, you gotta talk to this devotee, we have two problems with him here. You know? So he's taken the philosophy into his head and become crazy, right? Have you ever seen devotees do that? The philosophy becomes a psychology and then it's like, you know, so you have to distinguish. Here's a philosophy, and here's what a healthy person looks like when they look at the philosophy. Yeah, it's a place of, of death and misery. That's why I'm a devotee. That's why I'm excited to distribute books, because these people are going to get old and die without Krishna. Not like I sit and say, well, it's used to getting out of bed, because everyone's going to die anyway, today or tomorrow. Oh, Prabhu, did you hear so-and-so died? Yeah, what's the big deal? Yeah, everyone's going to die anyway. Yeah, you might die tomorrow. I'm like, yeah, so, um, so look at yourself and see, you know, if your head's tilting too much one way or the other. Because if it is, I think we will have a hard time building a house in which the whole world can live because people will feel our imbalance and they'll be like, hmm, this is not good. I think, I think all of us know, like if you're very liberal, you might think, you know, it might be good to marry someone who's conservative to kind of like balance me a little bit because I'm so over here that, you know, if they're over there, maybe my head will be in the middle. Have you experienced that before? Like, like sometimes it's healthy to be around the opposite. You know, I'm just a space case. I like details or like, I hate details. It's like, it's just not fun. And your whole life is, you know, you're always late and you forget where you're going. You, you drive to the wrong airport to fly off. And you know, I did that twice. So um, it's good to have a person that, you know, if you're, if you're um, a space case, marry a detailed oriented person, then they'll take care of everything. And the detail oriented person will mellow out because they're too like, we're three seconds late, you know, you get in the car, you know, you, drive, you have to drive at 63.46 miles to get there exactly on time. And, you know, and it, so you marry a person who's a little, little fairy headed and just like, whatever, you know, just chill out. You know. Isn't it? So, <laughs> if, if you're both detail oriented, um, that could be like interesting. 
maybe you need to start a corporation or something, you know, keep your detail, manifest your detail orientations so you don't drive one another crazy. You know. Dinner is 36.32 seconds late. What's wrong with you? Why did I ever marry you? Yeah. Who cares about time? Time is just relative. It's just an idea made up in people's heads, you know, to get along with you. Know. And then you you think, yeah, well, that's a better way of seeing things sometimes, yeah. So you all look at yourselves and see, you know, where you're out of balance. And if you see yourself, just remember this class. And like, oh, I'm getting a little too fairy headed here. Or I'm getting a little too detail negative oriented. You know, it's like everything's bad. Everybody's bad. All the devotees are bad. All the leaders in this country are bad. They're all bad. You know, do you ever hear those? Do you ever see that like Facebook? And it's like, what's wrong with the movement is that all the leaders are like, I doubt if all the leaders are the same. Believe me, it's not the way God made everybody. You know, just I guarantee you when you say everybody or it's always or it's never, that's not true. It is whenever you say, you're always like this. It's always like that. Always, never, any other way. Yeah, it's always like that. It's never like this. Never, it's never been. No, it's never. You know? No, I don't think so. Right? So <laughs> it's one of the relationship skills. When you're talking to your spouse, don't say you are always like this or you're never like that because it's not true. And it's not going to make them feel nice because it's not true. You're always late. Always, yeah, always. I'm never on time. Never. All right, well, tell me the last time I was late. I can't remember, but you're always late. You ever have a conversation like that? Well, Gabriella, if you haven't, you will. I guarantee you. And Honorata, you will also. And Tanya, if you get married, you will. And Nadia, well, I won't say anything to Nadia. <laughs> we won't talk about marriage with Nadia because we don't want to upset her. Um, um, Nadia, I want to tell you a story. This is this is a common story about the um, more about the brahmacharis than the than the women. The brahmachari who's like told me 108 times every 30 seconds that he'll never get married. You know those brahmacharis? It's like you know. That's basically all they talk about is the fact that they never get married, and and then after you know he's he's done his last. 108 times I'll never get married. A week later, you get the invitation to his wedding. I've seen that so many times. It is so funny. Yeah. Have you ever seen that before? Jyotir Mai, you ever seen that before? Why? You know why? You know what the reason is? Because it only takes one. You, you may think there's, of the 7 billion people, there's no one worth being married to. But I can guarantee you, out of the 7 billion, there's probably one. That when you meet that one, all of a sudden, there are the invitations go out. We're getting married next week. I like how long have you known her? Uh, three days. Yes. Ah. So as much as he was against it, that much he goes for it when he finds the right one. Well, I don't know if she's the right one, but she looks good anyway. So we'll find out if she's the right one later. So um, yeah. All right. We didn't get far on the questions yet. Did we? Okay, so let's go look at the questions, comments. Ta -da, ta -da. I'll never have time to get through all of it. So now we have to go back and remember everything I said because these were all comments made while I was saying something. That's why it's necessary to be related with a spiritual master you can get in contact with because he sees you and in a kind of way he helps you live the physiology in your life, the personal condition. You mean psycho physiology, psychology, yeah. Is there a hell for those who promise to chant 16 rounds and they don't do it? Yeah. And what happens when you go to that hell, I'll tell you what happens. You get to this hell and everybody's in the hell and they're all like this. Sneak, sneak, rom, rom, rom. Sneak, sneak, rom, 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 and you have to live with watching that for eternity. And then you're also going to chant like that and you go eternity there for chanting bad rounds. Yeah. So be careful. 
remember that everyone that you know you could end up there chapa channer's hell we mentioned that yesterday in the chapa retreat yeah. that there actually isn't one but if there is one that's what it would look like do you ever see a devotee chanting rounds and they're chanting so poorly you feel like going up to them and saying i hate you <laughs> do you ever have that experience i hate the way you're chanting can't you can't you just chant the mantra properly ah! you ever feel like that that's because that's how we chant and we can't stand it when we see someone chant as poorly as we chant isn't it that we go crazy and fires coming out of our head because we're seeing ourselves in them. It's like, oh, I don't want to say myself, but you're doing what I'm doing and I hate it. Stop it. You're reminding me of me. Isn't it? Sorry to be so direct. <laughs> yeah, maybe we have to change the name of this the raw truth. The truth behind the truth. Okay. So Krishna says, didn't he come to Kirtan? I think you meant Srila Bhakti Siddhanta and start playing off beats so the devotees would get out of enjoyment mode and continue. Um, yeah, or he would ask people who weren't good Kirtaniyas by material standards to chant or you know, like that. He didn't didn't want Srila Bhakti Siddhanta didn't want it to be a material thing. Why aren't there more liberal temple communities? Um, you hear that's a good question. The, the, one of the pro, you know, if you see like what you would evaluate as to be too conservative, it's because there's a real concern that we don't want to water things down. So if you're going to err, well, better err on the side of being a little conservative because then I know, well, this is what Prabhupada said. If I go liberal, then I'm I, gotta, I start making adjustments and I have to know this adjustment would be accepted by Prabhupada. So there's a tendency to be very conservative about doing that, sometimes to our detriment. But that's my that's what I think. I'm not that what I think I, I know because I know all the devotees. I don't know all the devotees, but I know many devotees who are managers, and this is their concern. You know, we want to make sure we're not deviating from Prabhupada. And we're handing over to the next generation something which is genuine. So it's a valid concern, but we may not always do a good job of it. Krishna Karshani says, I think devotees who are taking initiation in a moment of initiation, they are 108% 108% sure they will follow all the rules, chant 16 new rounds. But in due course of time, they are starting to realize they were not real in a moment of initiation and their life changed and they're not able to keep the promise in my opinion we cannot guarantee or we'll keep our initiation vows eight of ten initiation devotees in 10 years leave kc and one or two stay to still follow um that research may be i've never seen that research i think maybe i would like to see who made that research if you could show me it may be the i think also I, I don't doubt that, but um, I mean, if we look at the number of Prabhupada's disciples who left Krishna consciousness, it's probably um, not that as high as eight out of 10. So um, I would say more, well, maybe it might be more like, yeah, 20% are still here. So, <laughs> yeah, you can say the thousand Prabhupada disciples out of 5,000, but we don't know the other 4,000 if they're Krishna conscious or not. And it, it can be, a, it can also, you see, there's other issues. It's not just the regular principles, because when you get older, following the rules and regs are not so hard um, as when you're younger. But this is why I did a course on vows that's going to be coming out at some point uh, online, because I think. Part of the problem is we we're not as we don't understand commitment the way our grandparents and their parents and grandparents did. Um, I think we we are from a generation where commitment is taken lightly, isn't it? And I think our grandparents, great grandparents, their parents, their grandparents, great grandparents, their generation they took it more seriously. 
At least that's my theory. I'm not a historian, but I've seen that with older people. Um, one wonderful senior devotee said something that's stuck with me. This is from Tanya. In Krishna consciousness, there is no either this or that. There's only this and that. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's a beautiful way of combining both. I like that. Thank you. Yeah, there's this and there's that. And it's our job to amalgamate them in a way which is relatable and practicable by as many people as possible. Here in Italy is full of jokes about Carabineri, a police force, and they are the outmost stupid, what, the most stupid, according to these jokes, and everybody knows them. Everyone knows they're stupid, and it's just the way it is. Swimming is a Vaishnava sport, yeah, that's what we were told. Um, I have a story. I am at the swimming pool listening to you. Oh my God, who said that? Joe Termani. All right, you're bona fide, Joe Termani. You have my seal of approval. Um, we always heard swimming and wrestling, and then Prabhupada came to San Diego. The temple was, I don't know, 20 minute drive. I'm trying to think how. Yeah, maybe 15, 20 minutes from the ocean. And Prabhupada asked the president, are the devotees going swimming every day in the ocean? So that's proof. And the temple president said, no, Prabhupada, we don't want to waste time from our service. And Prabhupada said, oh, very nice. But so you have two, two things to go on there, that swimming is a violation of a sport, confirmed. And maybe you don't want to waste your time swimming. Now Jyotirma is feeling really bad that she's wasting her time swimming. But it's healthy. And if you're going for health, then do it. Stay healthy, everyone. And it also can relieve stress, right? And stress is really unhealthy. Okay. Carbriel is uh, all right. Um, okay. Nadia, that's my way of looking at things. What's the use of everything? We're all going to die. Yeah. We could write a song like that. And all the people who are completely out of balance will love that song. I mean, that's how I thought when I was 19. I was like, what's the use? We're all going to get old and die. So, like, just smoke marijuana, you know? Why not? Have a good time. Because what else is there to do? Yeah. So that's what I did. But um, then I read Bhagavad Gita. And I was like, oh, okay. There's actually a point. I haven't got married at 30. In 30 years, so probably it says something about me. Yeah, but I don't. That's for you to say what it says, not anybody else. Um, great class. I wish we could just upload this to our brains instantly. Okay. Maybe. Um, Maybe we should take this class and uh, put it on eternal, eternal repeat. Thank you for this class. What is the really, what? Uh, English is not his first language. Something, something for resolution of building big home, fallen situation, uh, people and liberal people. Is it possible to, Very good cooperation, such as, yeah. What is point zero? Yeah. Oh, I think he's saying, you know, how can we cooperate if we're like on both sides? Uh, that's why I gave this class, because one of the ways we can cooperate is just to understand a little bit more about our nature. And it's, it's what, what is difficult for us is if. I see the world in a certain way. It's really, really difficult for me to think that's not actually the way it is. That's probably probably the most difficult thing is you see something a certain way and I say, no, it's not that way. You're like, oh, what do you mean it's not that way? It is that way. No, it's not. That's the field. That's you're wearing rose-colored lenses. So you think everything is just fantastic. There are no problems. Everything's great. And the other person's wearing black glasses. It's all black. It's not rose, it's not black. Take off your glasses. There is a philosophy, there is a way to see things, which is not totally subjective. Now, we convince ourselves, no, it's, this is the Shastra. This is just what it says. But if you look at any debate, there's not any debate, but many debates on, on potentially 
and issues that are potentially could cause schism. There is so much on either side of the argument that would make you think, oh, that sounds right. Then you read the other one. Oh, that sounds right. Then you read this. Oh, that sounds right. That makes him wrong. And then you read this. That makes him wrong. So if you tend to lean one way or the other too much, that side's going to make more sense to you. So at least we have to understand that. Okay, this is what makes sense to me. I could be wrong because I don't know everything, right? That's the idea. Hare Krishna. Okay. Or Marnie, we're going to have to wait a moment because we're having a heated discussion about the future of this one. And we've just discovered we're all crazy. And I'm trying to put everyone's craziness back together because I don't want to leave them crazy because then they could sue me for making them crazy. They're going to go to their psychiatrist and go, what made you crazy? It was that class. He revealed everything crazy about me and I don't know what to do now. I haven't seen devotees chanting badly because I usually keep my eyes closed. <laughs> okay, for all you fault finders, when you chant japa, keep your eyes closed, then you'll never see anyone else chanting badly. That is a great way to end class. I love it. Okay, so you are all fortunate that you are now in the japa room. It's your lucky day. You're all here in the japa room. Okay. Just and, a moment, Maharaj, please. We will stop the Oh, broadcast. you have to stop. We're yes, yes, yes. Just a moment, Maharaj, okay. please. Class has a 50